So it's my pleasure today to introduce you to our second speaker of the seminar series, Draw Baron. Um, actually, both Ivana and I had the pleasure of meeting him at uh, the Asilo Marla late last year. And his was the one poster that so many people flocked around, and he really couldn't get together. So, I wouldn't be disappointed today. Uh, Dor uh, got his bachelor's and master's from uh, Technion and his uh, PhD from UIUC, and he's now a postdoc at Price. Thank you very much. So I, uh, I have several comments. First of all, I, I'm really glad that Malika contacted me and invited me to come. It's, it's a pleasure. And I, I like the Northeast, so it's a lot of fun. Secondly, uh, I want to really thank my collaborators, Amir and Destapur, who happens to be close by, so you guys should invite him over sometime. Okay. Which? You did? Mohammed? I did. I said he'll come. Okay. 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 And Rich Baranook and Sriram Sarpatam, who gave the talk at CSS last week. I also also want to point out that there are two ways in which we can give the talk. One is that I'll be talking and talking, and you'll be listening and listening. And for me, it's kind of boring. The other way is that you'll be interrupting me all the time. That's a lot more fun, at least for me. Maybe you don't like it. With that, I think we can... Oh, actually, last comment. I forgot my laser, so this is going to be an entertaining exercise in geometry of sticks. But we can begin. Several months back, there was an article in IEEE Spectrum that stated we may someday see the end of wireline. So they were, they were saying, based on the observation that in recent decades, both wireless and wireline communication rates have been increasing dramatically but the wireless has been catching up. So their speculation or conjecture was there's not going to be wire, wireline anymore 20, 30 years from now because wireless will be fast enough. But I don't really agree with that. Let's, let's first ask, you know, the, the simpler question, will there ever be enough data rate period? Now, Bob Lucky in 89 wrote, we're not very good at predicting uses until the actual service becomes available. I'm not worried we will think of something when it happens. So, what I'm trying to say, there are always going to be these new applications that will gobble up tremendous amounts of data rate. We're never going to have enough. But let's even accept that statement at face value and not try to be too contradictory. How much can we actually improve wireless communication? Can we improve indefinitely? Can we improve by six orders of magnitude? Well, of course, it's as many of you know, spectrum is a limited natural resource. And even if it were not, even if we had infinite bandwidth, information theory tells us that we need a lot of power to have high wireless data rates. You could you would say to yourself, well, okay, so my challenge is high wireless communication rates. My, my solution will be to transmit using a lot of power. But of course there are problems. First of all, environmental concerns. If we transmit a lot of power, we'll pretty much be cooking each other. That's not an option. Another issue is that many of the wireless devices are mobile, and they work on batteries. So we can't just use a lot of power because we'll need batteries to support that. Bottom line, wireless rates will hit some walls sooner or later. And what they said in the spectrum doesn't really make sense. So where can we improve? What, do, what can we do until we hit that wall? Well, I've come to talk about some communication games that can be made, but there are also additional communities that will obviously have an impact. And I like to think about it that you have, uh, just as often in a team, you have individuals. Here you have a team of fields where each field will make a contribution. Power efficient computation. Power amplifiers, batteries we already talked about, directional antennas, the list goes on and on. There are a lot of advances will, that will need to be made. Now, in terms of communication games, of course, there are going to be incremental improvements in channel and source coding, getting as close as possible to capacity, to entropy, etc. There could also be nice games beyond incremental by using more sophisticated source and channel models. But what about the so called last DB of communication games? We're not talking about the incremental stuff. Where, will, where do we have room for another 2 or 3 dB of improvement? What I'd like to say 
In this talk is that network information theory or Shannon theory holds that potential. Let me clarify. Traditional point-to-point -point information theory truly is point-to-point. -point. We have a single communication stream. One source, one encoder, one channel, one decoder, one destination for the data. And most aspects, theoretical aspects of this problem are well understood. Practical aspects, maybe that's a work in progress. Network information, on the other hand, has a plurality of communication streams. Possibly multiple sources, possibly multiple destinations, definitely more than one of something. And even among the theoretical results, few things are known. Now indeed, uh, Pierre Kumar gave a talk in Houston last week, and I'll, I'll just be quoting him. He was showing some what he called Mickey Mouse problems that network information theory hadn't solved. So really, this is, this is a field which isn't very mature. Having said all those things, my goal in the longer term is to understand the various costs of network information theory. However, there are costs that even traditional point-to-point -point information theory has overlooked. And what I'm going to show you today, or I hope to convince you, is that some of these costs are actually quite significant, could be quite significant in practice, and because of that, we need to be very aware of these issues. So, there's been a lot of progress in channel coding since the introduction of turbo codes in the early 90s. At that time, the performance was roughly half a dB below capacity. It's called a gap to capacity. And uh, that was using codes where the bit error rate was 10 to the minus 5, the block length was n equals 65,000. After turbo codes came around, there were additional improvements such as LDPC codes, irregular LDPC codes, and what we see here is roughly a tenth of a dB gap to capacity, uh, similar bit error rate, but now the block length has increased to a million. More recent results, I think 2003, they talked about the block length of 10 million, and the list goes on. Distributed source coding, there's also been a lot of practical progress. The main idea there, we're going to have two correlated sequences. X is going to be encoded using the syndrome portion of the channel code. Now the decoder, not only does it see the output of the encoder, it also sees the correlated side information Y. And that enables the decoder to extract, reconstruct X from a lower rate. Now, various types of channel codes can be used for this syndrome part. And as one example, uh, Jean et al. last year, they described a specific implementation of slipping wolf coding, that's this kind of thing, using LDPC codes. In their system, the conditional entropy, that's the lower bound on how well you can perform, was 0.47 bits per symbol. They used a rate one-half code. Now note, in the previous slide, channel coding, what you can communicate is below capacity in practice. Here, you need to describe the source using more bits. The rate is above the slightly wolf limit. The bit error rate was as before, block length 100,000. And uh, let's see, some additional practical things that happened in 2004 uh, there was some work that this group did, Jean et al., on multi-terminal source coding. In Allerton, they showed results using block lengths of half a million. My co-author, Amir Kutastapur, that you guys mentioned that he may be coming here, in his PhD dissertation, he uses uh, block lengths of 800,000 for relay codes. I know that relay codes have quite a following here. So, the bottom line is that we have a lot of different practical results, but the block lengths are very large. 100,000, half a million, a million, <coughs> So let's back off for a minute and try to understand why these block lengths are large. Now, information theory gives us a lot of lessons in NAS and dotted machine. Channel coding. If we back off by any positive delta below capacity, asymptotically, if the block length n increases, the probability of code word error will vanish. Same thing about fluffy and wolf coding. If we increase the rate by any positive delta, beyond the limit, once again, everything's going to be fine. Now, the problem, of course, is that the best practical results required these long blocks of 100,000 and beyond. And one may ask, do those results really require a large block length? Maybe those are artifacts of some simulation method, a specific code design, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The problem, of course, is that we live in a finite world. We don't always have, in our applications, data with millions and millions of bits. 
As an example, IP packets up to 1,500 bytes, emails hundreds of bytes, text messages even tens of bytes. Uh, even think about sensor network applications. In those applications, the battery life is a main concern, so it makes sense that we'll probably want to work with small data sets to conserve power. And after all those observations about the practical methods, how do they really behave in this finite world where the block links are perhaps 10,000 or even 1,000. And this leads to the main question of thought, how quickly can we approach the performance limits of information theory? Okay, any questions? This is kind of, this is as I mentioned before, I can talk or you can ask questions. So, so, so what is the basis for this 10 power 6 number that you showed in these previous um, examples? Uh, so why is it 10 power 6? Why, could, why cannot it be, for instance, like, I don't know anything about that work. Okay, that's okay. Yeah, yeah, that's okay. Uh, so what I can put it Look, the, the bottom line, what I'm going to show later, there are theoretical reasons to indicate that the larger the block length, the closer you can get to these asymptotic limits. Now, it turns out that the practical code designs, they pretty much approach the theoretical limits at the same rate, only with larger constants. I'll discuss that later. And basically, because they want, they want to show you a result along the lines of we are 0.03 dB below capacity, only 0.03 dB. In order to do so, they need to have very, very low block length. So, so for instance, if you use something like turbo codes, what are practical block lengths? Do they, I mean, I, I was under the impression that they could get away with sort of smaller block lengths. Uh, they can, yeah, but, they then, but then your performance is not going to be three hundredths of a dB below capacity. It'll be maybe three tenths of a dB, or maybe even one dB below capacity. So, so my, okay, so that was what I was looking for. So you're saying it's like, Instead of three hundred, it's like three tenths. So, so, so we're talking about. Okay. So I'm, I'm basically saying that they have nice simulation results, very close to capacity, or very close to the limit, 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 based on very long block lengths. But when you go to these more realistic numbers, they're no longer so close to the limit. Okay. No, the the I think you sort of answered it. Basically, yeah. the difference you're saying is that it's like within your whether you're within point five of a dB or within like 0 0.003 or 0 0.03, whatever it is. Yeah, I, what I, here's the point. If you take one specific method, the longer the block length, the closer you're going to be. To sure. That's, that's, that's kind of clear. Now, in order to have bragging rights, we're the closest channel code, et cetera, et cetera, uh, they're not, they don't tell you for a fixed block length who's the best. They just use the longest block length that they can get in order to get as close as possible to the best. Yes. All these assumptions are for a one-way channel. Mm -hmm. In two-way channels with ARQ, people can go, as far as I know, for smaller block plans, still use turbo coding, and then through ARQ mechanism, try to a degree to fix it and uh, work more efficiently. So all these block sizes are primarily for one-way channels. Yes, yes. Yes. Okay, any more questions? Excellent. Yeah, this is, this is a good discussion. So as I mentioned, how quickly can we approach the performance of performance limits of information theory? That's the main question, but there's more than that. We don't know the statistics either. What I'm trying to say is that, in theory, it's very nice to say, yeah, this is a uh, binary symmetric channel with uh, parameter 0.1. But in practice, you don't know whether it's 0.1 or 0.12. Now, in some applications of information theory, like loss of coding, where you're trying to losslessly describe a single source, it turns out that this is not a, a big problem. And let me elaborate. Suppose we have a length n input x, binary input, which has a Bernoulli distribution with parameter p. Now suppose we encode x using the wrong parameter q. There exist these cool tools called variable rate codes that basically, even though you're using the wrong parameter, you're only going to pay a divergence penalty which leads to a minor bit rate penalty as a performance loss. So you have a performance loss as long as you're kind of close to the true parameter. In contrast, these systems that I'm going to talk about today, channel coding, distributed source coding, these are systems that rely on joint typicality and in these systems, not knowing the true parameter is much more tricky. Suppose that the true parameter is P, less than a half. And we think that it's Q, which is less than P. These kinds of techniques are often relying on fixed rate codes, 
and they're based on joint typicality. So essentially, there's going to be a typical set to Q using the incorrect parameter Q, and that typical set is trying to cover the true typical set that we should be using TP. Now, Q is smaller than T, so as simpatically, the block length goes to infinity, TQ is going to cover a smaller and smaller portion of TP, and because we're not covering any of TP, essentially there's always going to be an error. So whereas in lossless coding there was a minor degradation, here, when joint typicality comes in, in these applications, not dealing correctly with the true statistics leads to performance collapse. So this is much more sensitive, requires much more, much more study, much more understanding. And those are really the two big challenges of the topic. How quickly can we approach the performance limits? I'll describe that for the two applications of channel coding and Slippy and Wolf. What about unknown statistics? I'll only do that for Slippy and Wolf, but the dual to channel coding, hopefully you'll be able to see that. But before we begin, I'd like to just very briefly give an outline of the prior art. And what I'm trying to emphasize here is that there definitely is prior art, but it, it doesn't answer these kinds of questions that we want to understand. <coughs> In 1958, Shannon wrote, this inverse problem is perhaps the more natural in application. Given a required level of probability of error, how long must the code be? Now, this is my take on Shannon. You know, maybe people that know Shannon personally may differ, but I think in the late 50s, the motivation for communications was based to a large extent on phone and space communication. In those kinds of applications, you had a capacity and you wanted to utilize perhaps 90% of capacity. And you wanted a very small probability of error, so small that the probability of having, let's say, a hardware failure was smaller, so let's say 10 to the minus 30. And based on these kinds of questions, of course, we want to ask, what's the block length in order to satisfy these kinds of constraints? But these are not the main driving applications that we're talking about today. In today's world, in the wireless paradigm, there's a different kind of regime. We have k-bits, and we want to communicate them with some probability of error epsilon. We want to do so using the minimal resources. Now, note that in this wireless paradigm, in most applications, packet retransmissions are perfectly legitimate. Because of that, whereas here we may have had 10 to the minus 30, here, maybe all of a sudden we have a kind of large probability of error of 10 to the minus 2. So of course what happens is that the block length will depend on the packet length k, and that leads to a different kind of question. Instead of what is n, I want to characterize the rate as a function of n block length of epsilon the probability of error. I could have written here k, the number of bits, but it's really dual to each other, so that's, that's not an important issue. Now, error exponents provide a good answer to Shannon's problem. If you fix a rate below capacity, and you also fix the code word length n, these error exponents provide bounds on the probability of error. They have a random coding and sphere packing, two different bounds. They're basically the form 2 to the minus n times an exponent, which depends on r, where these two exponents are identical for rates near capacity. Now we also have this small o of n term. Maybe it's important, maybe not. Let's discuss that. In Shannon's regime, we fix the rate. Therefore, e of r is fixed and the log of the probability of error is linear in n. Now, Shannon wants to characterize n, and because of that, you know, the probability of error is fixed. It's 10 to the minus 30. So he really has a very good characterization for this kind of problem. Error exponents are a good tool for Shannon. What about the wireless paradigm? Here, we want to have this probability of error using the packet retransmissions, let's say 1%. And because of that, n times e of r needs to be fixed. However, if n times e of r is fixed, and you have a somewhat large block length n, all of a sudden that small o term may be important. Especially if, let's say, n times e of r is kind of small, like maybe 6 or 7. So, of course, the small o term 
could be relatively important, and these two bells are going to diverge. And indeed, this is what we see here. As the block length increases from 100 up to a million, we have two bounds on the probability of error, the random coding bound and the sphere packing bound. Now, note that I used the binary symmetric channel under a very specific situation where the rate depends on the block length. The rate is not constant. I backed off below capacity by some tau over square root of it. Later on during the talk, you'll understand why I did this. The random coding bound seems to converge to some number. The sphere packing bound it decays as 1 over square root of n. So as the block length increases, those small o terms really have an impact. And unfortunately, because these two things are diverging from one another, it's difficult to precisely characterize the non-asymptotic rate that we're interested in. When we're very, very close to capacity, these tools don't really tell us how close to capacity we can get. So we need new tools. And I'll begin by asking the question, how quickly can we approach the channel capacity? I'll develop these tools. And this portion of the talk deals with no statistics. Okay, any questions? Okay. So here's our setup for the binary symmetric channel. We have a message S that is one of M possible messages. You can also think about it as a codebook size. Encoder F maps the message S to length and sequences. That's X. This binary sequence is corrupted by channel noise, Z. Z is distributed with Bernoulli parameter P, and the output of the channel is Y. The decoder G attempts to reconstruct the message by S prime, which is a function of Y. Additional things to note, the rate is the log of the codebook size divided by the block length, and we also have a probability of error, epsilon. Having all of these definitions in place, we can define the non-asymptotic capacity. We want to communicate as much rate as possible among all such codes that achieve epsilon and code word length n. Now let's stop for a minute and recall what happens in the asymptotic regime. The classical result about the capacity of the binary symmetric channel says that the, that capacity is 1 minus the binary entropy with parameter p. But what, what do we know about this non-asymptotic capacity? Well, in the classical textbook by Wolfowitz, there is a converse result and an achievable result. Both of these results are of the form C minus some constant over squared of it. Unfortunately, Wolfowitz only gave proofs of the form there exists a constant. And because of that, these two constants, in his case, differ. And although both of these bounds, as n increases, these non-asymptotic bounds, they converge to the true capacity as 1 over square root of n. Because the constants are different, there's a looseness between the two bounds. What we want to do, we want a more precise characterization of the non-asymptotic capacity. We want to tighten Wolfowitz's bounds. Uh, what I'm going to do now, I'm going to have two slides that illustrate our the ideas that we have for our converse proof, we also have an achievable proof that gives the same result. So the key idea is that we're packing typical sets inside the channel output space. So Tz is going to be a set of possible Zs. Z, once again, is a channel noise sequence. As long as the noise falls in Tz, and the probability of being in Tz is roughly 1 minus epsilon, then if we make sure that in that case there's no error, then there's only a probability epsilon of code word error. So this constraint takes care of the probability of error portion of the problem. What about the rate? Well, we have length and binary sequences, so this output space consists of two to the n possible sequences. We have channel inputs. And around each channel input, at the channel output, we're going to have Tz different sequences. Now suppose I have another channel input, and its version of Tz, let's say this one, suppose it intersects with the first Tz, then there would be an error. 
So the different TZs, we need to pass them in a way that they don't intersect. Clearly, how many TZs can we pack? Clearly, it's upper bounded by the cardinality of the alpha space, due to the n, divided by the cardinality of TZ. And in order to give the best converse bound possible, the largest converse bound, what we really want is to make TZ as small as possible while satisfying this constraint. This leads to the definition of the minimal cardinality set. And I'd like to point out that this, these kinds of notions of the minimal cardinality set that covers some probability, these notions exist in much of our work. So this is a very interesting notion in the non-asymptotic regime. And just as a brief footnote, this is not a typical set. Because a typical set will include sets whose empirical statistics are tr close to the true statistics. Here, Suppose the empirical statistics are in our favor. This is a very high probability sequence. That's actually a good thing. So this is a slightly new notion. Using this notion, the non asymptotic capacity, this kind of converse bound uh, is straightforward. But are we still... Yes, exactly. I mean, is it, so is it what, is it, I mean, we sort of essentially the yeah, so I, ideally, ideally you would have some maximum likelihood of decoding, but even even more than that, what, how many of these inputs could there possibly be? You just want these things not to intersect, and each of these things really consists of the biggest probability sequences. Okay? Okay. So here we have a bound of the non astronaut capacity, but we have yet to determine the cardinality of T min. So I'm not going to do that in detail, but I'll just briefly describe the direction how we can derive the cardinality of T min. Consider the empirical statistics. Nz, that's the number of ones in Z. <coughs> Pz, that's the proportion of ones. Now the true probability of error over the channel is less than that. Therefore, the probability of the sequence Z, to take, you know, take your noise sequence Z, that probability is monotone decreasing in NZ. So if NZ is zero, that's the highest probability noise sequence. If, it's, if NZ is 100, that's a lower probability noise sequence. Because of that, exactly like you asked, what is the minimal cardinality set? It consists of all noise sequences whose empirical is up to some threshold. Of course, that threshold needs to depend on epsilon. We're trying to cover 1 minus epsilon. How do we characterize that threshold? We use the central limit theorem. We have expected invariances for PZ, and we have a normal distribution. Now, of course, the central limit theorem, it doesn't, it's not a precise statement. This is only approximately a normal distribution, but we can make statements that are stronger than this. Later, I'll point out where this looseness comes in. Now, just as I said that the minimal cardinality set is a very important notion in our work, the use of the central limit theorem is also very important. Let me specify. In the traditional information theory, in the asymptotic regime, this threshold is set to be constant, P plus delta. And the law of large numbers says that as long as we allow up to proportion P plus delta errors, asymptotically, everything is going to be fine. But we're not doing P plus delta. We're doing P plus delta standard deviation. And the central limit theorem says that as long as we are delta standard deviations above, the probability of error is going to converge to the Gaussian error function at delta. So the way that I like to think about it, we have what I call a noise sphere. And if that noise sphere was at the ideal P, that was this noise sphere. We increase it, let's say, by three standard deviations, like one, two, three, and now we have a larger noise sphere. And because we have a larger noise sphere, we're packing in the channel output space noise spheres that are bigger. We have more resiliency to air. Three standard deviations of resiliency to air. So these are the two important notions that underlie our work. And also combining a similar achievable result that we have, we have a tight non-asymptotic expression for the capacity. Both of our regions, converse and achievable, they are the form C, the capacity, minus k over square root of n, plus a small o term. The k 
depends on x1, and it appears here. A very important thing to notice is this inverse Gaussian error function term. Another way of thinking about this result is that there's a gap to capacity, how much we need to back off below capacity, and that is proportional to k over square root of n, or I mean k over square root of n plus a correction term. Now note that this correction term asymptotically it vanishes relative to any one over square root of n term. So uh, this is really asymptotically it's insignificant. Uh, for smaller numbers, it may be significant, and that's really where the looseness of the central limit theorem comes in. There are all kinds of results about how quickly the central limit theorem converges, so this can be bounded, but let's, let's not get into that. Now, recall that Wolfowitz had those two purple bounds that were different. Now we have a bound that is tight to within a small O term. So we have the correct constant, which Wolfowitz does not have. Another interesting point is that the gap to capacity of LDPC codes is roughly two to three times greater than what our bounds indicate is possible. So you could say that we can approach capacity two to three times faster than we do now. So from that point of view, maybe LDPC codes are not very good. But I actually like to think about it differently. I like to think about it that LDPC codes are approaching capacity as one over square root of n. So they're, they're in the right ballpark in terms of the order term. All we're fighting uh, right now is the constant. So I actually like to have this more positive interpretation. Excuse me. Yes. Can we go back just one slide? I have a question. When you were discussing uh, noise, you were talking about the sphere. Now, uh, I want to make sure I understand. There are two ways in which you could make an error. Uh, one is if you choose fewer of those TCs than there are actually uh, code words to be encoded. Now, in the asymptotic case, you have the typical and non-typical uh, code words. I mean, tip to, and in the limit, you don't throw away anything with this thing. But you throw away our, our minimal cardinality set, in, in the limit, it's almost identical to the typical set. Right. Because the number of these large probability sequences is very small. But in the non-asymptotic regime, the, the probabilistic volume that the large uh, probability sequences occupy is they occupy a relatively large probability. That, that's really the difference. Well, what I'm wondering is, so you assume that every single uh, source uh, sequence is encoded, and then you worry about uh, the volume of those... Uh, well, here, those here, here, here I'm talking about, here I'm doing channel coding. So I'm assuming that uh, you have, uh, so I have one more slide. Uh, in each of these, uh, in each of these ovals, we have a point somewhere in the middle, and that point is the channel input. And the noise, the channel noise, carries us from the middle of the oval to somewhere in TZ. So we're just trying to basically throw channel inputs into the output space. Okay, but you're saying you have one oval for each, ch for possible, each, channel for each possible channel input? Yeah, for each channel input. Is there any benefit in throwing away some channel inputs and making the ovals larger? If you if you make the ovals larger, what will happen? They're going to they're going to cover more probability. So you're going to have a smaller probability of it. Right. Yeah. But, but, but now the rate will go down. Lower rate. So the rate will go down. No, but I'm looking at it differently. I mean, he, I have, as you said, I have a message. The message is a packet of information, like a packet. It just has to get there mm -hmm. or get lost. Mm -hmm. So there are two ways to get errors. One is uh, you just go out of those uh, ovals mm -hmm. and therefore you uh, make an error mm -hmm. but you never throw away any input codes another possibility is you get a particular input message you arbitrarily throw it away mm -hmm. and you made a mistake because you made it make an error because uh, at the receiver end you just have to randomly guess what you get and of course you make errors okay so, you, so it's, it's not clear to me that the optimal uh, I mean, the question is is it optimal to say every uh, input uh, message is encoded into an oval, and then we take our errors because uh, we may go out of those ovals, or is it perhaps better to arbitrarily throw away some input messages and make the ovals larger? Uh, well, I'll give you two different answers. Uh, first of all, in our, our specific analysis, we just do the analysis for block codes, so we're not considering this in our analysis. Now I'll give you a different kind of answer. Uh, I don't know why you specifically answered the question, but I've thought along similar lines 
uh, for network kinds of applications, where uh, perhaps the, perhaps what we're trying to do is to maximize the utilization of the channel given that we have packet retransmission. So we're instead of having 1% uh, probability of error, we'll be completely happy to have 3% probability of error if this enables us to significantly reduce the rate. Right. Is that your motivation? It's related, yes. Okay. So, so actually, uh, what you could do, do we have like, something to write on the board? Sure. Okay. So I can write on it? Yeah. Okay. So, let's see. So we're going to have something like uh, the non-asymptotic capacity and uh, if I if I recall the utilization of the channel, we need to divide by one minus epsilon. I think that that's how it goes in networks. So this is what the network people they I don't remember the letter. I think it's rho. This is the throughput without trace combining. It's just retransmission. Re if you're throwing away a previous packet, if you're keeping yeah. uh, around this packet, then it's better. Wait, you're saying if I'm if I'm keeping the packet to try to try and to help reconstruct? Yeah, to do soft recombining, then okay, okay. So yeah, I'm, I'm talking about made. throwing. Yeah, I'm talking about throwing packets. Yeah, that's an interesting point. Yeah. So, given this, you can try to optimize uh, the optimal epsilon. Uh, but what happens is that let's now turn forward a few slides. This is not asymptotic capacity. The dependence uh, is really an inverse error function. So once you're two or three standard deviations uh, below, essentially adding one more standard deviation is going to get you an incredible improvement in the probability of error. So this is just my rule of thumb, that two or three standard deviations, that would probably be the area which is of interest. I, I hope this kind of gave you a good feeling for it. Any more questions? Okay, so recall that Wolfowitz had these two purple bounds. We've tightened them up, and LDPC codes are pretty good. Now, here's the plot of non asymptotic capacity for the binary symmetric channel. Once again, the block length is increasing, and this is the non asymptotic capacity. Uh, the red is the asymptotic capacity for parameter 0.1 at the binary symmetric channel. And we have several different blue curves, non asymptotic curves, using different probabilities of error. This is 10 to the minus 4, a relatively small probability of error. This is 10 to the minus 1. So when we have a smaller probability of error, think of it as a harsh constraint, we need to back off more below capacity. Now there are two things that in my opinion are interesting to note. One of them is, if you look at Code with links that, as I was mentioning, are probably of practical interest in this kind of range, 1,000, 10,000, even for the relatively large probability of error of 0.1, you're definitely losing several percent. Another observation, when you allow more than one half, you're actually above capacity, oddly enough. Let's continue to the Gaussian channel. Uh, the differences here are that X, the channel input, is continuous. Z, the channel noise, is IID Gaussian. We also have a power constraint. The sum of the squares of X is less than or equal to N times P. Now, Shannon derived decades ago the non-asymptotic capacity for the Gaussian channel using cone packing techniques. In those techniques, this is actually an equal sign. Therefore, we have dependence between the symbols of the code words. So the code book design is non-IID because we have this dependence. In contrast, all the information theory textbooks, they all talk about using Gaussian code books where every single element of the code book is Gaussian IID. Unfortunately, using information spectrum bounds, we've shown that the Gaussian code books are strictly suboptimal in the non asymptotic regime. Putting these two observations together, there are certain channels, the Gaussian being one of them, where IID codebooks simply are not good enough. They're wonderful in the asymptotic regime. In the non asymptotic regime, they're not. And let's once again see 
how things look graphically, instead of non asymptotic capacity, here I use a tr- slightly different measure, excess power. So I'm using more power over the channel in order to get the performance that I want. And I'm plotting this extra power in dB. I have four lines here. This pair of lines, the upper pair of lines, is for 10 to the minus 4. The lower pair of lines is for 10 to the minus 1. So the intuition is, when we have 10 to the minus 4, strict probability of error constraint, we need to back off more. We need to add more extra power. Among these two lines, each pair has the Gaussian code book and the comb packing bound. So note that, once again, for these numbers of practical interest, the difference is between the optimal comb packing versus what we always read about in textbooks, we're not talking about a one thousandth of a dB or something. This could be more than a tenth of a dB. So this is definitely something that's worth understanding. At this point, we've covered the channel capacity and we'll, mo- we'll move on to split and we'll, we'll begin with known statistics, <coughs> then we'll move on to unknown statistics. How much time do I have? So let's begin with a quick review of the Slepian Wolf setup. We have two length and sequences, X and Y. They're encoded by two encoders to indices Fx and Fy. <coughs> Those indices correspond to rates Rx and Ry. Now we have one decoder that looks at the two indices and attempts to reconstruct both of the sequences. We also, of course, have probabilities of the error for X and Y. Uh, in 1973, Slepian and Wolf showed this perhaps surprising result. Uh, one might have thought that the rate for x needs to exceed the h of x, the entropy for x. Same thing for y, but actually it suffices to exceed, for each of these, to exceed the conditional entropy, conditioned on the other guy, as long as the sum rate exceeds the joint entropy. So what I've plotted here, using these three constraints, this is an entire region where any point in this region, asymptotically, if the block length increases, everything will be fine. We have a slightly specific kind of setup for something wolf. We're using a binary symmetric correlation structure, and that structure is dual to the binary symmetric channel, and we can copy a lot of our results. Side information Y, Bernoulli with parameter P, corrupted by a correlation sequence C, parameter Q. The output of this correlation channel is X. That's what we're actually trying to encode. Bernoulli R. R appears here. Again, we have an encoder F, a decoder G, and the main point is that this is actually coding with side information. The side information is completely available. We're not talking about how we describe Y. Let's compare this to the specific Slipping Wolf setup in this entire range region, we're only concentrating on this one point where essentially this is coding with side information. Uh, the reason that we concentrate on that one point is that essentially encoding the side information at H of Y, this has been covered uh, very nicely by the traditional lossless coding portion of information theory. So this, this is not a problem. We're only really going to talk about the challenging part of the problem. Uh, similar to our definition of non-asymptotic capacity, we can define the non-asymptotic slipping wolf rate. Uh, earlier on, we wanted to communicate as much rate as possible. Now we want to describe the source with as few bits as possible, as little rate. Of course, the minimization is among all the codes that satisfy N and epsilon. Again, Wolfowitz has prior art, two bounds that are above the slipping wolf limit, by different constants divided by square root of n. Because the constants are different, the two bounds are loose. And combining the results from the binary symmetric channel, (coughs) a similar kind of probabilistic structure gives us a very similar result. The non-asymptotic rate is the slipping wolf h of z plus the same k as before over square root of n, and again the small of term, which comes from the central limit theorem. So we've tightened Wolfowitz's bound, and at this stage we understand, for known statistics, how quickly we can approach the slipping wolf limit. What about unknown statistics? 
Now, there, there's been quite, quite a few works in information theory about the performance of these kinds of systems when statistics are unknown. Some people, they take the approach, let's fix the rate and get the best probability of error that we can. Well, I have a different take on the material. Those guys, they fix the rate, and maybe their rate is twice as high as the rate that we actually need, and their probability of error will be 10 to the minus 1,000. In my opinion, the more, uh, more appealing problem from an engineering point of view is let's fix the probability of error reasonably small, let's say 10 to the minus 3, and let's operate with rates as close as possible, as if we knew the true statistics. Now I'm going to propose a specific scheme that will do so, and I'll tell you how it performs later. I have the same setup as before with two changes. First of all, Y, the side information, is going to communicate, or the encoder for Y, will communicate the imparable, the number of ones in Y, to the encoder for X. This is new information which is available. What does this actually require? The number of ones is between 0 and n, so this requires roughly log of n bits. Now let's, let's think back. All, all what we've heard about is that the non-asymptotic capacity and rate and all that, they are 1 over square root of n in the rate below the limit. In terms of bits, this is order square root of n bits. Relative to square root of n, log of n is insignificant. So from an engineering point of view, this is a very modest penalty to pay. Once again, we want to operate as close as possible to the rate as if we knew the statistics. So we want a variable rate slipping wolf code, and that variable rate depends on two things, nx and ny, the statistics for the side information which are given to us and the sequence x. You might ask, well, we know the entire sequence x, why do we depend on nx and not x? Uh, it turns out that nx is a sufficient statistic for this kind of problem. So this is what the variable rate depends on. Now, when the statistics were known, the key to the understanding, the characterization of the non-asymptotic rate was using the central limit theorem to tell us something about the distribution of nz. We basically, we said that nz was like a Gaussian. Here, on the other hand, how could we possibly apply the central limit theorem when that parameter is unknown? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to tell you about, I'm going to show you a numerical example, no math. And that in numerical example will build some intuition, which hopefully will uh, give you some confidence in my math. Uh, P, that's the probability for the side information, that's point 0.3. Q, proportion of channel errors, or uh, correlation errors, if you will, point 0.1. And R, that's the parameter for the sequence that we're actually encoding. We're going to consider a situation where the empirical statistics actually equal the true statistics. Again, this is a numerical example. And we're going to plot the conditional probability of nz given the empiricals for x and y. Once again, nz is what we actually want to know. n equals 100. Block length 100. We would expect, because we have 10% correlation errors, we would expect nz around 10. So indeed, around 10, this thing is peak. N equals 1,000. We expect 100 errors, and yeah, this thing is kind of peaks around 100. 10,000. Yeah. Can anybody guess what this thing is starting to look like? Hmm? Yeah. So with about three, three, four pages of math, which in our Allison paper were amazingly condensed into half a page. Uh, incredible amount of uh, pain in my hand during the night that I actually derived that, and I repeated the derivation four times. I was actually, fortunately, the MATLAB confirmed my very painful hand. This is indeed a something that converges to a Gaussian distribution. The mean value is n times pz star. pz star is what I like to think of as the best guess for pz, given what we know. We also have a variance. Now, these are exactly the kinds of characterizations that earlier gave us a non-asymptotic rate. So here we just, we plug it into the previous math, and we get a non-asymptotic rate 
for this universal setup. Now note that this is not a converse. This is the performance of our specific scheme. That performance is H of P Z star. Again, that's the empirical best guess. So it's kind of like this, the sloppy and wolf rate if you knew the empirical best guess. And we have K prime over square root of N, where K prime is similar to K, but multiplied with this additional term. That additional term is appears here in its pod is below. Two interesting aspects. Uh, first of all, it's symmetric, and then at the extremes and at the middle, it has these interesting behaviors. At the extremes, PY going to zero or one, the function is going to zero. So K prime is actually smaller than K, smaller redundancy. How can that be? We'll discuss that. When we're around the 50-50 point, this function blows up. It actually goes to infinity. This means a huge redundancy. We're also going to discuss that. First, the extremes. Let's say PY is going to zero. In the null statistics case that we discussed earlier, the variance for MZ is constant, regardless of the variables. On the other hand, when the empirical is really small, let's say the empirical is strictly zero. If it's strictly zero, we know what the site information is. So we know what z is because we know x, x equals z. So in, when the empirical is very small, we can estimate nz very well with a small variance. So the real reason why the universal scheme outperforms the non statistic scheme is simply because we're using a better estimation process. But we're kind of cheating, if you think about it, because the universal scheme depends on a variable rate, and the non statistic scheme fixes the rate. So maybe actually this is this is an interesting idea. Maybe in the known statistics scheme, we can cut down the expected redundancy, expected because we're in a known statistics setting. And we do this by once again communicating the empiricals of the encoder and using variable rates. What's the punchline? We're going to communicate log of n. And that will enable us to decrease the constant in front of the square root of n. Uh, decrease, I'm sorry. So we're going to say order square root of n using only log n. The other interesting problem that I discussed, uh, when the empirical is close to 50-50, the function blows up. And almost strictly speaking, we, are, uh, we have a redundancy, which is proportional to 1 over square root of n. The constant is going to be incredibly big. Now we have another scheme, very similar in structure to what I described before. That, you know, there's a trickle of feedback going between the two encoders. That scheme has this kind of redundancy, order n to the negative one-third, and when you are within n to the negative one-sixth of 50-50, that scheme has better performance. Now, I know that there are a lot of order terms here. Uh, n to the negative one-half, one-third, one-sixth. Let's just take, uh, make it a bit more understandable with a quick numerical example. n equals a million, block length a million. As we said before, that's actually a large number. N to the negative one half is a tenth of a percent. N to the negative one third is one percent. N to the negative one sixth is ten percent. So when we are between 40, 60, 60, 40, uh, if you think about it, it's actually a pretty, pretty good range. In that range, instead of a tenth of a percent redundancy, we're paying one percent or order of one percent because actually the constant is several times larger. That's a pretty big price to pay. Our ongoing research is to improve the n to the one third. Uh, we have a paper that we submitted to the information theory workshop later this year where we show a substantially more complicated scheme that always has n to the negative one half. Uh, but again, it's more complicated, so everybody can prefer whatever, whatever scheme they like. Before I wrap up, I'd like to just give a numerical example. I'd like to emphasize that I tried not to cheat on the numbers. I could have easily given you numbers that are extremely persuading. I chose a block length of 10,000. I could have taken smaller, 10% errors. And the Sluffing Wolf says that we need 4,700 bits. The non asymptotic approach with 1% probability of error. I could have taken like 10 to the minus 4, and that would have given a better looking result. But in this case, 4,900 bits. So a bit more. Universal approach, the same empirical as before, 0.3, uh, it's gone up to 5,200 bits. Now, as I mentioned, the real problem happens when we're close to 50-50. So 
So I take this point three and I only increase it somewhat to point four, and all of a sudden we're above 5,800 bits. So if you compare this to this, for these numbers that appear not to be exaggerated, we're talking about 25%. So really what I'm saying is that for practical numbers, the penalty for unknown statistics could be very large. And of course, uh, here I'm talking about a situation where you know what you're doing. If you simply guess uh, what your parameter is or something, then we could have a problem. So let's, let's really summarize the talk. I, I began by discussing how network information theory really has the potential to increase wireless data rates by using these ideas that rely on joint typicality uh, for things such as Slutty and Wolf, multi-terminal source coding, etc., etc. Now there has been a lot of progress in practical code design, but that progress relies on very large block lengths. As, as you asked earlier, they're showing off that they're 0.0 something dB below, but they kind of don't emphasize that the block length is 10 million. That led to the main question of the talk, how quickly can we approach the limit? For the two applications of channel coding and Slippy and Wolf, the answer was at order 1 over squared of n, and for these specific systems, we characterized the content. Also interesting to point out that LVPC codes are roughly two to three times further away. As I said earlier, uh, I like to think of this as a positive result. That they're already approaching at the correct order, and now the only work to be done is you know, fixing the cost. Can you say the gas is the DB gas? Excuse me? Can you say uh, the gas is the capacity of what? <laughs> uh, in, in terms of in terms of rain. In terms of rain. Okay. When the statistics were unknown, I showed a very specific scheme, uh, which as you, show, as you saw on the slide, it wasn't really complicated. Uh, as long as the empirical is bounded away from a half, its performance was pretty decent. For empiricals close to a half, we had to resort to a, a similarly simple scheme with very large reductions. <coughs> I also mentioned that we have more sophisticated things that are n to negative one half, the idea there is that you have multiple rounds of feedback. And here I realize it's just only one round of feedback, if you will. Two encoders with one connection. Multiple rounds of feedback, of course, that's much more common. Okay, what about, this is Slepin Wolf, what about channel coding? Suppose you have an encoder and the channel output as a decoder conveys a trickle of side information to the encoder. This is kind of similar to what we discussed before, uh, but unfortunately, the capacity achieving distribution for the binary symmetric channel actually is, has an empirical 50-50. This is exactly the case where we have the large redundancy. So we either need to accept very large additional penalties in this kind of application, or we need to resort to this multiple feedback scheme that I've been telling you about. Either way, I mean, this, this, this you know, requires care. What about additional directions? First of all, I briefly mentioned the Gaussian channel. Yes. You, Larry, you have a question? Or? Okay. I briefly mentioned uh, the Gaussian channel. Shannon derived the non-asymptotic capacity, but his result, his optimal result, was based on code books that had some dependency within the code words. And we said that the Gaussian code books are suboptimal. What about other channels? Ideally, we would like to extend these results to have some general theory that says, give me your channel, I'll give you its non-asymptotic capacity. Turns out that this is a very complicated problem. And just as an example of why it's complicated, you have information spectrum bounds that can give uh, these kinds of characterizations. This is an achievable result. Unfortunately, the Gaussian combo distribution, once again, it's suboptimal. So there exist channels for which we must consider non-IID constructions for this kind of bound. And we need to consider these all possible non-IID constructions when they're being, when deriving, expressing the number. So of course this is not, not something easy. Now the final point that I'd like to emphasize, this is really the most important point in the whole talk, this isn't about channel coding and slipping wolf coding. Those are just 
example applications. All the applications in Shannon theory that rely on joint typicality, in all of these applications, we'll have this issue of the central limit theorem telling us how strongly correlated the different things are. And because of that, all of these applications, the penalties for finite block lengths and unknown statistics are going to be potentially very large in practice. And in order to design good communication systems, we need to be more sensitive about these issues. Thank you very much. Uh, additional questions? So in the case of channel coding, mm -hmm. the, in the search coding area, it said that you're adding an extra slide information between the statistics and known. In the case of channel coding, am I right if that you you derive better bounds with finite and as opposed to proposing new ways of doing the decoding? Yeah, these are these are just new bounds. Yeah. No, there there are uh, in the universal <coughs> case, uh, you could say that our schemes give you guidelines. Uh, you give me your best LDPC code, I'll give you a guideline how to add a bit, trickle to side information to do things well. Uh, but in the known statistics schemes, all we have are those. More? Okay. I guess that's it then. Yeah.